Good morning, everybody. Good morning. It's JPR, and welcome back to the Reviewing Every Pokemon Generation series. Today, we'll be taking a look at Generation 4, which includes Pokemon Diamond, Pearl, Platinum, Heart Gold, and Soul Silver. It's a pretty large generation, so let's not waste any time. Pokemon Diamond and Pearl kicked off Generation 4 in late 2006 in Japan, or early 2007 for the West, and was the first generation release on the Nintendo DS. That part is very important because the Nintendo DS came with this wonderful magical force called Wi-Fi Connection, which is something that Nintendo has only gotten worse with over time. Although Gen 4 didn't utilize the Nintendo DS's signature touchpad as much as many had hoped, it definitely took full advantage of the Wi-Fi capabilities brought to the table by the DS. The Global Trade Station is the first notable example of this that you'll find in your Sinnoh region journey, allowing you to trade Pokemon with anybody from around the world. A very cool feature to be sure. Though it did have some very minor flaws to it, such as being limited to only being able to request Pokemon that you've seen in your Pokedex, and a lot of the kids using the GTS must have fallen asleep in their social studies classes when the ancient technique of bartering was explained, because it seemed like 90% of people were attempting to give away a level 2 Bidoo for a level 100 Mewtwo. It was a bit irritating to see the least. A lot of people would also just get on the GTS to troll, requesting things like a level 9 or under Latios, which of course is impossible to obtain without hacking it in. So yeah, the GTS was far from perfect, but it was a very cool addition nonetheless. Local Wi-Fi was also an important staple in Generation 4, as most notably seen with the Underground. The Sinnoh Underground was great. You could go down to mine fossils, make secret bases, exchange ores for treasures with NPCs. Even if you were just playing by yourself, there was a ton of fun to be found in the Underground. Pokemon contests and later the Pokeathlon competitions could also be played together with friends over Wi-Fi, but honestly, it was so incredibly slow that I personally couldn't find any joy in it. But hey, it was an option. Transferring your Pokemon from previous generations also made its glorious return in these games through a service called Pal Park. Now, I'm gonna be honest for a moment, it was nice that we got transferring back and all, but Pal Park wasn't the greatest. Every time you wanted to transfer your Pokemon, you had to be subjected to this mini game where you had to re-catch all of your previous Pokemon in the wild, and sometimes they just wouldn't show up for freakishly large periods of time. Also, you were restricted to transferring a minuscule six Pokemon per day, and this wasn't fixed until three years later when Heart Gold and Soul Silver came out. It just ended up being needlessly tedious. But I will say it was a great non-Wi-Fi feature that actually made some great work of the DS's dual slot capability. Wi-Fi battling naturally also became a huge hit in this generation, and it really helped kick off the popularity of competitive Pokemon battling. The new groundwork for EVs and IVs were already laid down in Generation 3, so the only major tweak to battling that Generation 4 decided to make was redefining the physical special split. Prior to Gen 4, all moves would either be physical or special depending on what their typing was. For example, all electric moves were special and all ghost moves were physical. Yes, Shadow Ball was a physical move that dropped special defense for some reason. It was dumb. The main issue with the system was that it rendered some Pokemon unable to use moves of their own type. Sneasel is a great example of this, as it's a Pokemon that specializes in physical attack, but both Ice and Dark were special types. Fortunately, Gen 4 decided to assign each move its own attribute, so now Shadow Ball could be special, while Shadow Claw could be physical. This was an incredibly beneficial change for many Pokemon, so it deserves all the praise possible. Alright, now that we got the big generation-wide features out of the way, let's narrow our focus to strictly Diamond and Pearl for a moment, because who boy! Boy, these games are really, really flawed. One of the biggest drawbacks in the Nintendo DS at first was the engine Game Freak was using was incredibly slow. Walking was slow, running was slow, the battle UI was slow, the battle animations were slow, surfing was slow, exploring dungeons was slow because of Sinnoh's over-reliance on HMs, and some routes existed purely with the purpose of slowing you to a crawl. Contrast this with how lightning fast the Gen 3 games were, and you were in for a rough time. Heck, it takes 17 seconds just to run from a wild Pokemon in Diamond and Pearl, which beats all other games by a landslide. Diamond and Pearl also have another really big issue, the Pokedex. And I'm not talking about the Pokemon designs from this generation, because again, those are incredibly subjective. I'm talking about the base Pokedex for the main story of Diamond and Pearl. For some reason, you're back down to 150 Pokemon, which discounting Fire Red and Leaf Green because they're remakes, is the smallest regional dex that we've had since Pokemon Yellow. Gold, Silver, and Crystal had a regional dex of 251 Pokemon, Ruby, Sapphire, and Emerald had a regional dex of 202 Pokemon, so why are we back down to 150 in these games when this generation introduced 108 new Pokemon alone? 
Well, that's the problem. Out of these 108 new Pokemon, 30 of them are locked to the post game, including almost all of the new evolutions introduced to old Pokemon in this generation, which leaves us with another big issue. If you don't choose Chimchar as your starter in Diamond and Pearl, that means that Ponyta is the only catchable fire type for the entirety of the main story. Poor Flint was hit by the recession the hardest as he barely keeps his job by using Pokemon that are just able to learn fire type moves. We do get some nice things out of Diamond and Pearl though, despite some minor inconveniences like a Bidoof HM slave being an absolute necessity to make it through some areas, the Sinnoh region does have a number of routes that are as open and explorable as Hoenn, which makes the region itself rather interesting. Sinnoh also plunges into the deep lore of the Pokemon universe, focusing on the creation of the Pokemon world and the deities that protect its existence, which admittedly was a very interesting step for the series. I still think that the evil team in this generation, Team Galactic, misses the mark by a lot. Anyone other than Cyrus in the organization is just kind of glossed over, and I find most of their character designs to be laughably goofy. The story is also paced nearly the same as Ruby and Sapphire, beat for beat at times. Yes, the story is darker than Ruby and Sapphire, and the stakes are higher this time around, but it does very little to push the series out of its comfort zone, which is the main issue I have with it. But now we get to talk about Pokemon Platinum. Platinum fixes a lot of these issues from Diamond and Pearl and makes the Sinnoh adventure incredibly more enjoyable. Yes, Platinum is still pretty slow, all things considered, but at the very least it speeds up a considerable amount of animations and says, surfing animations, what are those? Let's just make us see your not traveling at baby crawling speed. The Sinnoh Pokedex has also increased from 150 to 210 in Platinum, and man, oh man, the addition of those 60 extra Pokemon is all this region needed, to be honest. Not only do we get the Magmortar line added to the decks, but we also get Houndoom and Flareon. That's still only five fully evolved fire types in the regional decks, but at least the type exists now. Not only does Platinum fix some of Diamond and Pearl's fundamental flaws, but it actually adds quite a bit of new post-game content as well. Diamond and Pearl already had the sub-region simply known as the Battle Zone, which was large enough on its own, but Platinum ups the ante by adding its own Battle Frontier, giving you a considerable amount of legendary Pokemon to catch, and giving you the opportunity to have high-level battles against some notable trainers from earlier in the game. All in all, I'd say that Platinum is easily one of the most challenging, if not the most challenging, Pokemon game out there, which is something I really appreciate. A smaller detail worth noting is that Platinum introduced animated trainer sprites and battles against important NPCs. Combine that with the mid-battle dialogue introduced by Diamond and Pearl, and you get a pretty good sense of all the personalities these trainers have. Cynthia is calm, cool, and collected, Barry is raring to go, and Gardenia really just wants you to- Hey, look over there! That's another general improvement in this generation, the characters have much better defined personalities than those from the Hoenn region. Oh, and of course, I'm legally obligated to talk about the Distortion World in this review. It's definitely one of the coolest dungeons ever given to us in a Pokemon game, though I wish it had a few more puzzles to offer rather than just one cliche strength puzzle and an upside-down waterfall. Okay, I can't bash the upside-down waterfall. That was pretty cool. Honestly, I just hope that when we eventually get Sinnoh remakes that we'll be able to experience the Distortion World in 3D because that would be amazing. Oh hey, remakes! What a great segue into the other pair of Generation 4 games, Heart Gold and Soul Silver. Unlike Fire Red and Leaf Green, which seemed very concentrated on perfectly recreating the Gen 1 experience, Heart Gold and Soul Silver truly goes the extra mile. We get walking Pokemon in these games, we get Yuzine and Suicune from Crystal added in, we get the Kimono Girls added into the main story, we get an event focusing on Giovanni and Celebi, we get two entirely new routes in Johto along with the Safari Zone, we get the Embedded Tower which allows us to catch the Weather Trio in the post game, and good lord, I have barely even scratched the surface of all the new additions. If Fire Red and Leaf Green were good, remakes, then Heart Gold and Soul Silver are godlike remakes. Almost nothing from Gen 2 is missing here, it's only new content being presented, and somehow, some way, it never comes off as forced or cluttered. It's no wonder why a sizable portion of the Pokemon fanbase considers Heart Gold and Soul Silver the greatest Pokemon games ever made. These games have enough content to last you a lifetime without sacrificing any of the quality that you'd find in most of the Pokemon games before it. Some of the issues like Pokemon diversity and the lack of EXP in Johto are still glaringly present in these games, but honestly, those are pretty minor nitpicks compared to all the new stuff we got. Generation 4 got off to a pretty rough start, with Diamond and Pearl arguably being some of the most flawed Pokemon games out there. Although Pokemon Platinum couldn't rectify all of these mistakes, it did address most of these issues, all while adding as much new content as possible. And honestly, all enhanced versions should strive to do as much as Platinum was able to. Heart Gold and Soul Silver was then able to uphold that same standard of quality and deliver us nothing short of a fantastic remake. Although many of the Wi-Fi features introduced in Generation 4 are no longer usable, its focus on player connectivity was yet another great asset that paved the way for future generations to improve on. The fourth generation of Pokemon is well deserving of an A-. 
I hope you enjoyed today's video. Be sure to let me know in the comment section down below what your thoughts are on Generation 4. And if you really liked it, then be sure to leave a like and subscribe for more content. I'll see you guys next time. Thank you.